Hi, fifth grade. I hope you're doing well today, and so far you're enjoying our read-alouds, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The last video stopped right as Edmund had entered the Castle of the White Witch for the first time, so that's where we're going to pick up and start reading. Here we go. Edmund crept up to the Ark and looked inside into the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion crouched as if it were ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the ark, afraid to go on and afraid to go back. With his knees knocking together, he stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the ark as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it could not have been looking at him at all. But supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund, Edmund in fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood at, with his back to it about four feet away. Aha, thought Edmund, when it springs at the dwarf, then it will be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now, at last, Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch, turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion, and as soon as he thought... Of that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course, it must only be a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow. Then very slowly, and with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now, he had hardly dared to touch it. But at last, he put out his hand very quickly and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief that Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan that they were all talking about. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. That's the end of all their fine ideas about him. Poof! Who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there, gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the, on the lion's upper lip, and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Then he said, Yeah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble, staring up in the moonlight, that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues around him standing here, and there rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard when it was halfway through the game. There were stones and stone wolves, and, and bears, and foxes. There were lovely stones shaped that looked like women, but who were really the spirits of trees. There was a great shape of a centaur, and a winged horse, and a long, lithe, lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there, perfectly lifelike, and also perfectly still, in the bright, cold moonlight, that it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree, with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from the doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it. There was a flight of stone steps going up to an open door. Edmund went up them. Across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right, it's all right, he kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf, it can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. 
Instantly, the huge creature rose with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great red mouth, and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. My name is Edmund, and I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day, and I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close, in the beaver's house. She wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently the gray wolf, Margrim, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars, full as the courtyard had been, of statues. The nearest the door, the one nearest the door, was a little fawn with a very sad expression on his face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if it might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close behind this sat the white witch. "I'm come, your Majesty," said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. How dare you come alone, said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not tell you to bring others with you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I've done the best I can. I've brought them quite close. They're in the little house on the top of the dam, just up the river, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. A slow, cruel smile came over her face. Is this all your news? she asked. No, your majesty, said Edmund, and proceeded to tell her all he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What? Aslan? said the queen. Aslan, this is true? If I find you have lied to me, please. I'm only repeating what they said, said Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer attending to him, clapped her hands. Instantly, the same dwarf who'd Edmund, who, whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sledge, ordered the witch, and use the harness without bells. Chapter 10. The Spell Begins to Break Now we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, There's no time to lose. Everyone began, began bundling themselves into coats, except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table and said, Now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down that ham. And there's a packet of tea, and there's sugar and some matches. And if someone will get two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner. What are you doing, Mrs. Beaver? said Susan. Packing a load for each of us, dearie, she said. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey without anything to eat, did you? But we haven't time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any minute. That's what I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Get along with you all, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want as big of a start as we can get, said Peter, if we're to reach the stone table before her? You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she had looked in here, as soon as she has looked in here and finds we're gone, she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver. But we can't get there before her, whatever we do for she'll be on a sledge, and we will be walking. Then, have we no hope? said Susan. No, no. Now don't you get fussing. There's a deer, said Mrs. Beaver, but just get half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of the out of the drawer. Of course we've got a hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep under cover and go by way she won't expect, and perhaps we'll get through. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband. But it's time we were out of this. And don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver. There, that's better. There's five loads and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she added, looking at Lucy. Oh, do please come, said Lucy. Well, I'm nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver at last, allowing her husband to help her into her snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine's too heavy to bring? 
Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver. A great deal too heavy. And you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose. I can't abide the thought of that witch deal finding it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it, as likely as not. Oh, please, please, please do hurry, said the children. And so at last they had all gotten outside, and Mr. Beaver locked the door. It'll delay her a bit, he said, and they set off, all carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped, and the moon had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file. First Mr. Beaver, then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, then Mrs. Beaver last of all. Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and on to the right bank of the river and then along a very rough sort of path among the trees right down by the river bank. The sides of the valley, shining in the moonlight, towered up far above them in either hand. Best keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't bring a sledge down here. It would have been a pretty enough scene to look at it through a window from a comfortable armchair, and even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first. But as they went on walking and walking and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep it up at all. And she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all its waterfall falls of ice and at that white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver, going pad, pad, pad through the snow in front of her, as if they were never going to stop. And we are going to stop right there. We have a few more pages to go until the next chapter. So click on the next video, and you can find out what happens. Thank you for listening.